I am slowly making my way through a reread of Court of Thorns and Roses. I'm doing chapter by chapter recaps, so it's taking me some time to get through that. But I also recently started a reread of The Hunger Games. My Discord decided on a whim to buddy read these since they're having a bit of a moment leading up to the prequel movie. And rereading the opening chapters of The Hunger Games so closely next to Akatar reminded me of how much Akatar sort of borrowed from the beginning of The Hunger Games. And it certainly wasn't only Akatar around 2011, 2012, 2013, lots of books were coming out that were heavily influenced by The Hunger Games. The books certainly because it takes publishing some time to sort of <laughs> catch up and churn out trends. But this was around the time that The Hunger Games is reaching pop culture critical mass because the movies are coming out around this time. Now The Hunger Games is also like not the first or only and it won't be the last <laughs> book to do things like war games or a female hunter or a character who has lost a parent or, uh, you know, a character who is a provider for their family. But we have to be able to admit that the popularity of the Hunger Games and the, those tropes certainly had an impact and an influence on the books that were coming out around this time. Now, it's almost kind of a shame <laughs> to compare these two books, at least from my perspective, because at this point, I consider the Hunger Games like a modern classic. And A Court of Thorns and Roses is one of the worst books that I've ever read in my entire life. But I think maybe that's what makes the comparison really interesting, especially when you consider how almost beat for beat, Sarah J Mass is emulating the beginning of The Hunger Games. So what makes it work so well in The Hunger Games and almost entirely fail, at least to me, in Akatar? We can start right at the beginning with the opening line. So The Hunger Games starts, when I wake up, the other side of the bed is cold. My fingers stretch out, seeking Prim's warmth, but finding only the rough canvas cover of the mattress. The opening line of Akatar is, the forest had become a labyrinth of snow and ice. I'd been monitoring the parameters of the thicket for an hour, and my vantage point in the crook of a tree branch had turned useless. So when we consider that opening line of The Hunger Games, especially if we're familiar with the story overall, that is a piece of brilliant and long game foreshadowing that our main character Katniss is reaching out to her sister and what she finds is just a cold bed. I love that opening so much. I think it firmly seats us in our main character's point of view. It introduces something of her emotions almost immediately that she's reaching out to whoever this character Prim is looking for her warmth and, and doesn't find it there. I think that that just conveys immediately a lot of information. And by contrast, what we see with this opening line in Akatar is kind of what happens a lot with what Akatar did generally. And it it's that it removes some of the emotion and the like one-to-one -one personal touch. So what we're getting more of in that opening line for Akatar is the forest, the labyrinth, the snow, the ice, the parameters of the thicket, and her just kind of saying, I've been waiting here and I found nothing, which has a similar sense of like Katniss waking up and finding nothing, but removed from any touchstones that I feel have that emotional connection. And we're, we're focusing a lot of the description there on the outside, the snow and, and the surroundings and I think that that just doesn't convey as much information as immediately and sort of like in the long scheme of this book of Akatar, this also doesn't have any sort of staying power like I'm not going to think about that line at all moving on from here here, Collins does start feeding us information that we need to know, but she does so in a way that is very tied to description and to action. So Katniss is sort of taking us through her day, and in the meanwhile, she's telling us what we need to know. So even when she's feeding us information, it doesn't feel like info dumps. So Katniss wakes up, she looks over, her family's still sleeping, there's a cat, <laughs> and she tells us she doesn't like the cat. But in the meantime, as she's telling us about like why she doesn't like this cat, she tells us that she almost drowned it when, when her little sister found it because that was one more mouth to feed. And now when she has a kill, she feeds it the entrails, and that's how they kind of keep the peace between Katniss and the cat. And so what we learn immediately is that this family has known hunger, right? They are not in a very good situation. We know Katniss is a hunter, but she's never said, I am a hunter. She just tells us, when I kill, I feed the entrails. So it's very tied. It's very seamlessly done, the information that we start to get, especially as Katniss sort of like walks through to where she's going, through the seam. She tells us the coal miner should be here, you know, sort of huddled over with the work and with the coal in their, in their nails and sort of baked into their skin. So we're 
learning about the town without it being like, this is a mining town and life here is very hard. Uh, it, by contrast, when we meet Feyre, she is like sitting up in a tree and we spend so many of those opening lines describing the setting and the thick snowfall and how cold it is. And so it sort of becomes really removed from the character herself. And even when we're getting these like information, being fed this information, it feels incredibly unmoored. Like Feyre will say things like the hunters said something about, and it's like what hunters said what, or like the lullabies that they sang to us explained all of this useful information about the Fae. You're like, what lullabies that who sang to who? It is all completely unmoored from people and time and place. And it's just like, I don't know, some people said some things and now I'm telling it to you guys in a way that isn't as graceful. Spend some time in the forest with Katniss and Gale, and this does an excellent job building dread leading up to the reaping, hearing them talk about it, but also talk about how difficult their lives have been. But also it teaches us a lot about the character, about Katniss's character, especially as we see Gale in comparison. Gale is complaining. He, Gale is a dreamer. He's like, what if we ran away? And Katniss is so practical that she's like, absolutely not run where <laughs> like she she doesn't even want to entertain some of these things so we immediately learn so much about this character which we need because we're going to very quickly get into a situation where we're like at the reaping and we need to feel things for our characters and this is an excellent way having this byplay with gail to like build up the character by contrast farah is alone in the woods and there isn't that same sense of why we should care about her or what she's doing in fact, everything about her killing the wolf felt really nonsensical to me, especially because the wolf shows up and it stops snowing. And it's like pretty obvious to us that this is not a normal wolf. But there's this like weird internal monologue that Farah is going through. It's not like, well, I don't care. I'm desperate. It's kind of like, no, no, no. It's a regular wolf. Don't worry. Uh, in a way that is like, what? <laughs> like, I, I did not like that sequence of event at all. And I don't think that it did the same to sort of build out Farah's character, which is a shame because we do need sort of that investment in her character because she also is leading up to a place where she's going to get reaped for all intents and purposes. One of the worst things about rereading Akatar has been all of the ableism. It is deeply uncomfortable, particularly because a lot of it is coming from Feyre, directed at her father. And it is a complicated relationship because her father is unable to provide for their family and that burning is placed on Feyre. But the reason that he is unable to provide for the family is because he is physically disabled. And so instead of looking at that dynamic with any sort of nuance or complexity, what we have is Feyre just sort of spouting all of this ableism, considering her father a burden and talking about how he chooses not to sort of provide for the family. And not only does it suck because it's ableist, but it sucks because of what it does for the character of Feyre. That is not endearing us to her at all. By contrast, we have Katniss, who also has a very complicated relationship with her mother. After her father passed and he was the breadwinner, her mother becomes deeply depressed and is unable to provide for the family and puts that burden on Katniss. And so Katniss is able to look at that situation and say, this really sucks. And it has maybe broken my relationship with my mother beyond repair. But I also know that it wasn't her fault. Like she, she was incapable of caring for us at that moment and so the way that the story treats Mama Everdeen is so completely different <laughs> than the way that Sarah J Mass treats Papa Archeron and the the difference is like night and day the time we reach chapter two, which is the reaping scene where Katniss volunteers as tribute, that is emotionally affecting because we have in a short amount of time understood who this character is and the character dynamics that we need to understand in order to make that emotionally effective and the harshness of this world. And so when Katniss steps up for her sister, that is also like shorthand though, you know, like that's part of the reason that it works is like a sister's sacrifice is like an easy way to get emotional investment. By contrast, when we reach chapter four in Akatar, where where Feyre is being pulled away from her family. All we have seen of her family is like negative things. And there isn't the same sense of sacrifice. Feyre is being pulled away because she murdered someone and <laughs> she needs to go like pay the price. Uh, and she, and there's a moment she looks over at her like family cowering and her father is cowering as well. And she thinks one more body to defend. And so the emotional investment is just not the same. Sarah J. Mass tried to copy the beats here. She wasn't successful.